Okay, next up we're going to have Tarun Prasad, and he's going to tell us about um, his project which studied active learning and its applications in the analysis of the scientific data, predicting knee scattering by nanoparticles. And I wanted to add that his mentors were Mr. Samuel Kim and Mr. Peter Liu. Yay, Peter. Thank you. And good afternoon to everyone present here. Uh, yep. <laughs> so machine learning is a very powerful statistical tool that finds various applications in our everyday lives. For example, we see it being used in personal digital assistants like Siri and Cortana, in uh, character recognition softwares and programs, in spam classifiers by email service providers, and so on. Now, another use of machine learning happens to be in science. But using machine learning for scientific research can have both benefits and limitations. The first benefit is that it can make predictions on unseen examples uh, based on previously learned data, such as one example of that would be in medicine. But there are also various other examples of this. Another benefit is that it can provide insights into how scientific systems behave and can perhaps be even used to derive the very equations that govern these scientific systems. But these benefits don't come without their limitations. The first one being that uh, to make accurate predictions, machine learning requires really large data sets. And these large data sets, especially in science, can be very difficult, time consuming, expensive, or in some cases even unethical to obtain the data labels for these data sets. So this is where we introduce a concept known as active learning. So this concept in machine learning is based off the idea of active learning in a classroom. Now normally when a teacher teaches a class, there are two ways in which this can happen. The first way is where the teacher comes into the class, delivers a lecture, the students take notes, and uh, the students take notes and learn the concept and they all leave. The second method, in my, which in my opinion is much better, and I hope, I, I believe that you, all of you will agree with me as well, is where the teacher interactively allows the students to ask questions during the class so that the students can clarify concepts which they are not very clear about the first, rather than the teacher just delivering a lecture. So this concept in machine learning is very similar. So basically the learning algorithm interactively queries the oracle, which could be, a, for example, a human annotator. And the query data points are the ones that the algorithm is the least confident about making predictions. So by doing this, you can effectively lower the size of the input data set without actually compromising on the accuracy of the predictions. So the question that we are trying to answer in our study uh, based on this is, can active learning be uh, used effectively for scientific research? And if so, how does it compare to the existing methods of passive learning? And which are the best methods to, do, to perform active learning? So the model we used for our research is known as a uh, Gaussian process regression. So mathematically, a Gaussian process is defined as a stochastic process that is a collection of random variables, such that every finite collection of those variables uh, has a probability distribution that is jointly Gaussian. So in the context of machine learning, let's say that uh, x is uh, a vector containing the observed input values, and f of x is the corresponding true y values, and x star is the unobserved input values, and f star uh, is the corresponding predicted values. The objective of the GP regressor, the Gaussian process regressor, is to uh, determine the probability distribution of f star given f, x, and x star. Uh, so by doing this, any Gaussian distribution is characterized by its mean and its standard deviation, or variance. So by doing this, you can obtain the prediction, which is the mean, the predicted value, as well as the uncertainty, which should be the standard deviation. So one example is shown in this graph, where this red dotted line represents the function y equals x sine x, or f of x equals x sine x. But the algorithm doesn't know that. All it knows are these six data points, which have no noise. So uh, based on uh, these six data points, it's able to make a prediction, which is represented by this dark blue line, as well as provide an uncertainty for uh, different values of x. So this is the 95% confidence interval, which is basically the un uncertainty value. So the, the, the most important takeaway from this is that this uncertainty uh, can help uh, interpret the predictions in a much, uh, much more complete manner. And in our case, we use this uncertainty value uh, by, uh, we use it in the active learning algorithm so that the algorithm can know which uh, data points it's the most confident about and which is the least confident about. So the, so the specific data set that we used in our uh, project is related to the physical phenomenon of mean scattering. So uh, we uh, considered na na uh, multi-layered nanoparticles where the layers were alternating uh, silica, titanium dioxide, silica, and so on. So for example, in, this is a three-layered nanoparticle where x1, x2, and x3 are the respective thicknesses of the layers. And these three thicknesses form the input to the algorithm. The output is the scattering cross-section. So another example uh, is shown here, where, which represents the data set for the two-layered uh, nanoparticle. 
So the two axes are respectively the thicknesses of the two layers, and the color represents the scattering cross-section in nanometer squared. The main reason we use me scattering uh, as our data set is because it's a fairly complex phenomenon, but it's also, we understand the math behind it very well. So we can easily generate a testbed database to test our algorithms on. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, active learning requires certain measures of confidence to know which data points it's the most and least confident about. So there are many ways of measuring this confidence, two of which we have used in our study. The first one is uncertainty, which as I explained earlier, is output by the Gaussian process regressor. The second one is spatial distance. So uh, this effectively uh, provides you with uh, the, the extent of isolation of a particular point. It's calculated as the uh, distance to the, uh, of, an, of the evaluated point to the closest point in the training data set. And so the, uh, the data point with the maximum uncertainty in the first case, or the ma maximum distance in the second case, is the data point uh, that the algorithm is the least confident about, and is hence the one that is queried. So by queried, I mean that uh, uh, the, the data label for uh, the point is queried, and it's added to the training data set, and the, the regressor is retrained. So we compare these two uh, algorithms with uh, passive learning, or random sampling, which is the, uh, the machine learning algorithm commonly used, as well as absolute error-based sampling, where we use absolute error as the metric. So uh, we, would use, we, we would expect absolute error-based sampling to act as the upper bound of performance, because uh, it takes into account the absolute difference between the true y values and the predicted y values. And we usually wouldn't have access to those true y values in, a, in an actual situation. And we perform these comp comparisons using the, this loss function as the sum of uh, squared differences between the true y values and predicted y values. So this plot uh, shows you the results of active learning. So I want you to focus on these two curves over here, the orange and the green curve. Uh, so what you see over here are the two uh, metrics used for uh, active learning, uncertainty and space filling, respectively, or the spatial distance. So uh, this is a, this is a, uh, the y-axis is a log scale of the loss, and the x-axis is the progression of active learning, or the number of training examples. So clearly it shows that uh, both these metrics perform much better than the random sampling method. And although they don't perform as well as the absolute error method, uh, that, that was an expected result. So similarly, the next graph as well shows similar results, where we keep a constant R square or coefficient of determination value of 0 0.95 between the true y values and predicted y values. And we can see that both uncertainty and space filling result in a huge reduction in the number of training points required to achieve the same accuracy. So this, this is a really interesting and a really exciting result for all of us because it means that uh, in, a, in a, any application in science, we would need a huge, a, drastic, a drastically lower number of uh, training examples to obtain the same accuracy. So for example, in the case of uncertainty, we would need 79 uh, tra training examples less and 74 in the case of the space filling algorithm. So one drawback of active learning is that each time you, you query a data point and add it to the training set, you've retrained the entire algorithm from scratch. So this is suboptimal because it's very slow and inefficient. So one way of solving this problem would be through batch querying. So here, you, rather than uh, querying one by one, you would query in batches of a certain size. There are many ways to select these batches, uh, the first of which is known as the top k uh, algorithm, which essentially involves selecting the uh, k most uncertain examples and creating a batch out of that. Now, this is a very simple but also a naive uh, method of batch querying because uh, it doesn't account for a sort of diversity of spread in the data labels. On the other hand, the gap top k is similar to top k, but in this case, it introduces a, a certain diversity in the data label, in the training data points, by introducing a gap between uh, the selected data points. The k cluster centroid algorithm works on the basis of an unsupervised learning algorithm. Uh, we specifically use the k-metoids algorithm for this purpose, where it clusters uh, the n most relevant data points into uh, k clusters and selects the centroid from each cluster to be queried. So the, the values of k, g, and n that you see here were uh, determined by, through optimization of different values. Uh, so the, here you can see the results of batch querying. Uh, so the two dotted lines here represent what you saw earlier, the sequential methods of random and uncertainty-based uh, active learning. So the first thing that you can notice here is that the top k algorithm performs really poorly compared to even, random, even the random method. So the main reason for this is because of the lack of diversity. As soon as one... Um, uh, data point is queried, uh, the, the remaining k minus one data points that are also queried are likely to be in the same uh, region or the same cluster as the first data point. And so they don't add much new information to, uh, to the batch querying algorithm. In comparison, if you look at the gap top k and the k cluster central algorithm, they seem to be performing almost as well as the sequential learning algorithm. 
uh, with the gap to upkey algorithm in, uh, slightly ahead, it, because it minimizes the loss slightly faster. But the main reason for using batch querying is not only for reducing the loss, but for reducing the time for taken for active learning. So let's have a look at the uh, time plots. So here uh, you can see that uh, the sequential method of uncertainty takes a very long time as compared to uh, both all three batch querying algorithms. I'm not sure if it's very clear here, here but this line uh, over, it, this overlaps both the gap top k as well as the top k algorithms. It's, it's almost exactly the same. Uh, now the top k algorithm, although it performs really fast, is not very useful because it doesn't minimize loss very quickly. On the other hand, uh, what's really interesting here is that the gap top k algorithm results in a decrease in time of almost 90% uh, compared to the sequential algorithm. And uh, what's even more exciting is that this, is, this decrease in time, relative decrease in time, is, is likely to increase even more as training progresses. Because this curve uh, seems, uh, seems to climb much faster than uh, in the case of gap top k. So that's something that I found really interesting. Uh, so now let's assume that you don't understand anything that I mentioned in the entire presentation and that uh, you don't remember anything when you go home. It doesn't matter. I want you to keep in mind these four main points wh when you go home today. The first of which is that active learning can be very useful in scientific research. So this has, active learning can have various applications, especially when, uh, for example, um, the, the, the experiment uh, requires complex uh, calculations or uh, phys physical human effort and um, or highly expensive equipment and materials and so on. Uh, and uh, for, for our data set, the space filling method performs the best. Thirdly, in the, uh, to improve speed of active learning, we can perform querying in batches rather than sequentially. And lastly, uh, in batch querying, the gap top k uh, method results in the best performance in terms of both time as well as loss reduction. Now this is actually a surprising result because it doesn't entirely agree with the findings of Shen and Zai in 2005 in a research study they, con they conducted in 2005. Although they as well found out that the top K algorithm performs uh, very poorly, uh, they also uh, discovered that the K cluster centroid algorithm performs the best, which whereas our results clearly show that the gap top K algorithm performs better in terms of both time as well as loss. So that's something I, I found interesting as well. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank uh, my mentors, Samuel Kim and Peter Liu, as well as our, uh, the PI of the lab, uh, Marian, Professor Marin Solyacic. Uh, I'd like to thank Daniel Michael, Franklin Wong, as well as the TAs, uh, as well as Anthony Cheng for reading my paper and providing suggestions uh, in the presentation as well. I'd like to thank CE, MIT, as well as RSI for this amazing opportunity. And lastly, I'd like to thank my sponsor and uh, the dean and director of my school, Dr. Mrs. Vaiji Patsarathy, without whose support none of this would have been possible. Thank you. Great work, Tarun. Are there any questions? Um, OK, I saw your hand first. Um, so you mentioned, from the previous slide, you mentioned the uh, previous work, which I saw the OK, so, so the question was, uh, I mentioned that uh, this, there was a difference in the results between my work and our work and the previous work. And uh, are there any reasons behind that? So uh, I can't give a specific concrete answer to that, a definitive answer, but I can give a few um, reasons as to why it could possibly be. So firstly, one reason is that they used a very small data set as compared to ours. For example, the data set that we used contained 30,000 30, training examples, whereas they used two training data sets, one of which con contained, I think, 92 training examples, and the other contained 48. So there's a huge difference in the number of training examples used. Um, and secondly, also they use a non-scientific data set. They, I think they used news data, data related news. Whereas we used, of course, uh, mean-scattering data. So that could be some of, that could be one of the possible reasons as to why this difference was observed. Um, yes. So uh, what is the absolute error method? Uh, and, uh, why are we just, why don't we just use that? Uh, yes. And then uh, and you also <laughs> say at the end that the uncertainty method performed the best, but it looked like the uncertainty method and the space filling method seemed to perform pretty similar. And I guess I was wondering why they looked, they, is it just coincidence that they performed relatively similar? Okay. Uh, so the question was, uh, what exactly this absolute error method is and why we don't use that? And also, uh, uh, regarding these, uh, the uncertainty and space filling methods, why, why are they similar? Uh, so firstly, we calculate absolute error as the absolute difference between the true y values and the predicted y values. But, uh, and based on that, the, the uh, point with the maximum absolute error is queried in, these ca in this case. But normally, we would not have access to the true y values, because we, were, we wouldn't know 
what the actual operation was, because if we knew that, we wouldn't have to perform machine learning in the first place. So, <laughs> and uh, coming to the second part of your question, um, between uncertainty and space filling, we also did uh, plot uh, the, the sort of relation between uncertainty and space filling. And what we observed was that uh, both of them were highly correlated, at least for the lower uh, input dimensionalities. So for example, for the two-layered nanoparticle, we saw that the uh, Pearson co coefficient, correlation coefficient was around 0 0.87, which is uh, probably one reason as to why both of them perform very similarly. But uh, between the two, um, the, the space filling algorithm performs slightly better, I guess, because it reduces the loss slightly faster. So. OK, um, math professor. <laughs> Yeah, sure. What was your space filling algorithm? Uh, the space filling algorithm was one second, uh, using the spatial distance metric. So, so uh, essentially, the data point with, that was most isolated, that it was, it was the furthest away from the closest training data point. So we would expect that to perform well, because uh, if, it's, if there are no other data points in the proximity, in, uh, proximity of this, uh, this data point, then we would expect that it would be uncertain there. It, it, the confidence wouldn't be that high over in that region, as opposed to if there were a collection of data points in the same region. Okay, we'll take two more questions. You? Um, so I have two questions. First question is in Make the them short. <laughs> in the loss function graphs, is that on the training data or the testing data? And second question is um, since during, like, as training progresses, the samples become harder and harder, so how do you prevent your machine learning model from overfitting? Okay. Uh, so the first question was uh, about the, lo the loss function in this case. Okay, uh, so we trained the data using the training set, of course, which contained r from thir uh, 30 to 200 training examples. But as I said, the total data set contained around 30,000 examples. So we used the uh, examples not used for training for testing. But we also had a repository set from which we searched uh, for the specific data labels that, were, uh, that had the highest uncertainty. So we essentially had three data sets to work with. Or we divided our data sets into three parts. So, and uh, sorry, what was your second question? So Okay, so, yeah. so the second question was about how it prevents overfitting. So essentially because we're using separate data sets for training as well as testing. So if we were, use, if we were going to use the same uh, training data set for testing as well, then, and we got high results, then we can't use that as uh, significant results. But since this is completely different unseen uh, data points, we can, uh, and, and it had a high, uh, pretty high, pretty low loss. So, yeah. Okay, uh, last question. I see your, is that Franklin? Yeah. Hi, Franklin. Yeah. So the space filling algorithm seems to query points independently of the results of the, of the query. Is that right? Yes. That's so then, why couldn't we like just pre-compute the points beforehand and then do a passive learning algorithm there? Uh, pre-compute the points in what sense? Uh, like, we, we don't need to know what the results of the queries are to find the next point in space filling, right? Uh, that's true, but uh, it takes into account the already existing training examples that have already been. Uh, trained. That is, uh, it, it determines the space, the, the distance from an evaluated point in the repository training set in our case, in the repository set, the distance from that point to the, the closest point in the training data set. So it's already been trained with a certain number of points in the training data set. No, but does this mean that we can find the sequence of points to query before we have the answer to the query? True. So why couldn't we just train on that set of queries? That is essentially what uh, batch querying is, I mean, sorry, active learning is all about, right? Because. Uh, we know all but the problem with that, that, that is the reason we use batch querying. Because uh, if you look at the top k uh, batch querying algorithm, what that is doing is it's selecting the k most, uh, or in the case of space filling, the k uh, points that have the greatest distance to the closest training point. Right, so uh, if, you, if you query all those together, they are very likely to not provide much more information than if you query just one point. Because all of them are likely to be in the same cluster. That is, if you have a, uh, a region that is completely isolated, if you add one data, data point over there, and then the next uh, most uncertain point will change now, depending on which you've queried in the previous iteration. Okay, so you guys have all question? night to fight about this. <laughs> so um, without um, any more questions, thank you so much. Thank you.